A ghostly form bleeds through a painting. A possible forgery. We had suspicions early on the signature and date that appear on the painting were not original. The National Gallery of Victoria is lined with secrets. Now, a giant leap in technology is uncovering the history hidden behind the brush strokes. Oh, and that's it. Here she is. Revealing concealed gems with stunning clarity. It was one of the most exciting things of my scientific career when we actually saw that uh, image come up. And providing brand new insights into the works and the artists who created them. This is Edgar Degas' Portrait of a Woman was purchased by the National Gallery of Victoria back in 1937. And at the time, it was pretty controversial. A lot of people weren't crazy about the brown colours, but particularly, they didn't like the discoloration across the face. But it turns out, that's a clue to a great mystery. There's always been this unusual aspect to it, a second form lying underneath what we see now. So when you look at the face, you can see a hidden shadow of the underlying face. Early attempts at unmasking the figure gave only a glimpse of what lay beneath. With conventional X-radiography, that's used to basically take an X-ray of your teeth or a chest X-ray, they could see a very faint outline of a woman underneath. We did what was called infrared photography, and that showed a reasonably good form of half the, um, the underlying painting. And then we did conventional radiography, but both these techniques didn't really give us enough information. The researchers needed a more powerful technique to uncover the hidden woman. <sighs> Meanwhile, elsewhere in the gallery, another acquisition was drawing suspicion. It's an interesting painting. It's always confused and puzzled historical researchers and um, technical researchers. The North Wind by Australian artist Frederick McCubbin was acquired in 1941, just four years after the Degas. And again, something seemed amiss. We had suspicions early on. The signature and date that appear on the painting were not original. Really, it was the date that was said to be painted, and stylistically, and even the colouring of the painting didn't look anything like it should look. It felt like a painting that was painted earlier than, than that time. Could it be a forgery? Well, one thing was clear, the painting was badly in need of restoration. So we removed it from display and I began the process of looking at it and then did x-rays um, and elemental analysis and it got more and more complicated. The analysis revealed some interesting clues, visible features hinting at both an earlier creation and later changes. The conservators are trying to really get their head around what this artwork is, how it was made, what aspects are original and maybe what aspects might not be original to the artwork. What does the face beneath the Degas look like? Is the McCubbin a forgery? These riddles will be answered later, but solving them would take 80 years and immense advances in technology. In fact, it would take an immense piece of technology, a particle accelerator the size of a football field. Australian synchrotron. Here, a series of tunnels and some high-tech apparatus accelerate electrons to produce beams of light that are a million times brighter than the sun and narrower than a human hair. This light can be used to probe the fundamental nature of things, scan tiny cells, or reveal surprises hidden behind layers of paint. You're about to go into the tunnels. Um, where the uh, accelerator is and we're generating the electron beams. Normally, the interior of the synchrotron is off limits due to radiation. We shut the accelerator down every Monday and we do maintenance work to make sure everything keeps going. So I get a rare opportunity to go inside. You can see all the equipment around here being the high voltage power supplies and the controller systems. So what's your electricity bill? Well, it comes out at about a couple hundred thousand dollars a month. 
A month. A month. The journey starts at the electron gun. This is where the process begins. Electrons are generated here. They're then accelerated to enormous speeds by powerful electric fields as they move down the tube here. Already by about this stage, they're travelling at 99.99% of the speed of light, and that's not nearly fast enough. From here, the electrons are ejected into the booster ring, where they speed up even more before being transferred to the storage ring. And now that we've got them here, this is where we can start to generate the light and the X-rays that we use in, in our experiments. So how do you do that? So what we have here is a series of magnets. This one's called a dipole bending magnet. And the electron beam is going past very, very fast towards the speed of light. It hits this magnetic field, and it really doesn't like that at all. This causes the electrons to emit light across the electromagnetic spectrum. Not only visible light, but X-rays. These X-rays are then channeled down specialised beam lines to experimental workstations. And that's where the research happens. The beam of X-rays comes down this tube and then the painting is passed backwards and forwards through it, creating this incredibly detailed image. Now, a good mobile phone will give you 12 megapixel images these days. They can create pictures up to 1,000 megapixels, a gigapixel. This technique is known as X-ray fluorescence microscopy. When the X-ray beam hits its target, in this case, various atoms in the paint, the atoms respond by emitting secondary X-rays, known as fluorescence. So each element that's in that painting, or any sample for that matter, gives off a characteristic signature. And so we scan that uh, sample through the beam and we basically collect all the elemental information. We were able to extract out the pigments, the X-ray fluorescence from the pigments underneath and, and build up a reasonably good image. To do this, the priceless painting is carefully loaded into a purpose-built mount. Then it's time. They measure the exact locations of the different pigment mixtures used in every fraction of a millimetre square pixel of the painting. We could actually watch in real time as we were scanning the painting back and forth, the image coming up, and yeah, we were all very excited when we, we were getting that image coming through. It's this high resolution, real time imaging that's revolutionary. And it's the result of a revolutionary piece of technology, the Maya detector. The detector itself is actually 384 separate detectors, each one millimetre by one millimetre. So we can have a very high rate of x-rays going into the detector because we split them up into 384 separate channels, each with their own electronics. Oh, okay. And that's, that's one of the that's keys the behind... That's the speed. Exactly. It's the speed that takes this non-invasive analysis to the next level. Well, x-ray fluorescence has always been thought of as a really powerful technique, but a really slow one, and we've sped it up, basically. So it's industrial automation for science. Oh, it was an absolute game changer because we could scan so much faster and we could do that scan in under a day and a half when other, otherwise it would have taken a year and a half. Because it's incredibly fast, it records with a thousand times more detail than was previously possible, steadily peeling back the layers of these decades old riddles. You could actually see individual brush strokes. So it was just amazing to actually see that amount of detail that uh, was in the painting. It's always an exciting moment, and there's different aspects to it. One of them is you're seeing something which no one's probably seen since the artist covered it over. So you feel a personal connection to that, that artwork, which is, you know, really exciting. Feels like we're secret agents. Back in the gallery, it's time to see what's been revealed. Here, behind the scenes, I get to see what's behind the paint. So this is um, two synchrotron elemental maps of the same region in the painting, obviously the region where the horse's head is shown. The one on the left is a map for mercury, um, and the one on the right is a map for zinc. And zinc has been solely used by the later hand to restore the painting. So we can see, for example, where there was a tear, they filled it in with, with zinc white and then retouched the area very broadly. And so it's an interesting way of mapping out across the surface um, the original and non-original layers. What was particularly important is 
when we looked at the use of zinc around the cincture, um, we see repairs that cross over the, the cincture, or underneath it actually, but also um, it's very clear to us that the um, cincture is painted in, in zinc containing pigment as well, so non-original. So that signature has definitely been put on later then? Yes, by later hands. But who did it and why? Marks seen on the X-ray hint at what happened. It's been reformatted in two dimensions. So it used to be longer on one side and less, less deep on the other. Um, now the reason I know this is because in the centre is a stretcher bar which runs down the middle of the painting. But when you look at the X-ray, um, to the left of the current stretcher is the damage marks from many years ago where the first stretcher originally was. And if it's in the centre of the painting, you can see that in actual fact there's a quite a bit missing to the left-hand side. So someone's just cut a section of the painting off? They have. If you're going to sign a painting on the left-hand side, you wouldn't sign where the signature ended up, but you'd actually sign it across on this left-hand side here. So that's another explanation of why the signature might have had to be reapplied at a later date. The signature was indeed added later, after early restoration attempts meant the original signature and date were removed. But who re-signed the work? There's actually a pattern of works that were owned by the family that were um, prepared for exhibition and some of them were re-signed and dated by the artist's son, Louis McCubbin, who did this with the best of intentions to ensure the legacy of his father. One legacy of the North Wind is insight into McCubbin's process and evolution of ideas. Originally, McCubbin planned to have a second horse, a sign of prosperity, but he later discarded that. The arid scene we see today was initially a lush and green landscape. And the main horse goes from holding its head high to being downtrodden and weary. That's a dramatic change, going from sort of a lush green landscape to a drought landscape. It is. It is. It's a big change. Do we have any idea of why he would have done that? What we're seeing here is Frederick McCubbin developing ideas about nationality, about the hardship of the Australian landscape, about the pioneering spirit. And most likely this painting was painted in 1888, which was the centenary of Australia. This research allowed the NGV to restore this commemoration of the Aussie battler to its former glory. Back at the synchrotron, it's time for Degas' hidden portrait to be unmasked. So what we're seeing here uh, the scans for particular metals. That's right. So in this image here, we have a, a cobalt map, which would be a blue color. And then switching to manganese, which shows the nice outline of the hair. So that would have been combined with iron uh, to make a pigment called umber, which is a brown pigment. And so, so naturally, the, you could tell that the, the hair would be a, a brown color here. It's quite beautiful, actually, just like that. Next a specially designed software program layered the different elemental maps into a colour profile of what this painting could look like. Here she is, right here. Isn't that beautiful? You say false colours, but that's your best guess as to what the original colours that, were. That's our best guess based on the elements that, that we observed, yes. This groundbreaking research by Darrell and colleagues resulted in a paper in the prestigious journal Nature. For Darrell, whose background is in chemistry, not art, it's gratifying to see a face and a story emerge from what once looked like a flaw. I think it's mesmerizing. I, I can't stop staring at it, actually, so it's, I think it's amazing that he did cover it up. I'm not an art expert by any means, but it's, I think it really draws you in and you keep staring at it. So who is this mesmerizing woman? We're still working on the identities. There are clues. We look at other artworks. Um, we look at the forms in other paintings. Degas also took photos, so that's also an interesting reference point in this case. While they can't say for sure, they do have a possible candidate. We've suggested that it's a, a model that had been painted by Degas several times called Emma Daubigny. Daubigny, one of Degas' favourite models, worked with him around 1869. But Portrait of a Woman is thought to be from the late 1870s, so he may have had the original painting lying around the studio for years. She was actually painted by several other uh, French artists as well. There are quite a few images of her out there in the world, and so it only took, I would say, five minutes for, for us to 
sort of do an internet search and see other paintings by Degas and said, oh, that really looks like her. While we may never know her true identity, the scan did reveal insights about Degas himself. It does tell us something about Degas as a practitioner. It tells us about his willingness to abandon one form and start a new one, a sense of spontaneity about his practice and a sense of, sense of creativity. It is a deliberate thing and it's quite unusual. Normally an artist would maybe paint over the underlying image and start again or scratch back the, the form. But in this case, he's actually partly included the early form into the final form. These discoveries are only the beginning. The powerful combination of the Maya detector and the synchrotron's X-ray microprobe is sure to shed light on more mysteries in the future.